Thank you. Good morning. I now welcome representative or the representative from Access Nell, now in Digital Rights Watch. Oh, he's on the phone. I beg your pardon. I now welcome rec representatives from Access Now and Digital Rights Watch to give evidence uh, by teleconference and by Skype. For the Hansard record, would you please state your full names and the capacity in which you appear before the committee? Uh, so I presume I'm supposed to go first. My yes, name is Elizabeth please. Duche. I'm the chair of Digital, uh, sorry, excuse me, I'm a board member of Digital Rights Watch and I'm representing a broad coalition of civil society organisations who authored a yes. submission in response to this bill. Thank you. And this is Nathan White. I am the senior legislative manager at Access Now. Thank you. Although the committee does not require you to give evidence under oath, I should advise you that this hearing is a legal proceeding of the parliament and therefore has the same standing as proceedings of the respective houses. The giving of false or misleading evidence is a serious matter and may, may be regarded as a contempt of parliament. The evidence given today will be recorded by Hansard and attracts parliamentary privilege. <clears throat> now I invite you to make an opening statement before we proceed to, to discussion. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee. Uh, I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Sulet Dreyfus, Angus Murray and Justin Clackety, who've already provided evidence to this committee, representing the Alliance of Non-Profit Organisations of which Digital Rights is a member. Digital Rights mission is to ensure that Australian citizens are equipped, empowered and enabled to uphold their digital rights. We advocate, campaign, lobby and advocate for a digital environment in which human rights are respected. The history of this bill is deeply worrying. Uh, it shows a failure of the democratic process. After an incredibly short consultation period by the Department of Home Affairs on the exposure draft of the bill, we saw less than two weeks pass before the government introduced a largely unchanged was immediately referred to this committee. And I'd note that we were not consulted on this bill prior to this process commencing. We were also appalled to see direct interference into the work of this committee from both the Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton and Prime Minister Scott Morrison, conflating terrorism with encryption as the ministers have attempted to do through the media is dangerous and wrong. The actions by the Australian government throughout this process show an alarming disrespect for the fundamental principles of a liberal democratic society, which include consultation, engagement and public consideration and participation. Law enforcement and intelligence agencies already have considerable powers at their disposal to deal with the threat of terrorism. The claim that strong encryption hampers their efforts to do their job has not been justified in any meaningful way. Protecting our digital infrastructure, which strong encryption does, is critical to our economy and society. And introducing threats to that protection, which this bill does, puts us all at risk. Pretty much the only people in favour of it are those who will gain powers from it. The bill is an example of law enforcement and intelligence agencies putting their interests above those they are supposed to serve. We should never presume that increased powers for such agencies is synonymous with national security. We have been told this bill is necessary to protect security, but I would argue that the opposite is true. Our national security depends on strong encryption, and this bill puts that at risk. For the past few months, Digital Rights Watch has had the privilege of working along with other organisations companies opposing this bill. The scale and diversity of this opposition is frankly unprecedented. It includes human rights organisations, trade unions, cryptographers, academic security experts, businesses and industry groups, technology companies and telecommunications providers. I urge this committee to heed the warning that is being offered by this diverse coalition. We've also seen the Australian public express their concern about this legislation in considerable numbers, which is particularly notable given the technical complexity contained in this bill. Facilitated through my own organisation's efforts to inform and engage the public, a total of 14,981 people personally wrote to the Home Affairs Department speaking out in defence of strong encryption and their right to communicate and use digital technology securely. This is an issue that voters understand and take seriously. Polling undertaken by the Alliance for a Safe and Secure Internet revealed that 84.8% .8 of Australians <laughs> believe it is important that anything the government does to, to combat crime should not create weaknesses in Australia's online security systems, nor make it easier for criminals and terrorists to cause further harm to everyday Australians. People are not foolish enough to think that fear -mongering, mongering around terrorism justifies compromising our digital infrastructure. 
Australians understand that encryption is not a barrier to a safe society. Quite the opposite. It's a form of protection against criminal acts. Encryption helps protect our digital infrastructure, including our banking system, our health services, our electric, electricity distribution system, and communication systems. If we weaken it for one purpose, we weaken it for all purposes, including enabling bad actors, and we do so at our peril. We have numerous concerns with specific elements of the bill, all of which you'll find in our submission. In particular, we're concerned that it introduces a seemingly scopeless definition of des designated communication providers and a very long list of agencies who can use the powers. It excludes any judicial review process to, to scrutinise the exercise of these powers. The safeguards that are included are so poorly drafted that they are essentially rendered meaningless. It creates an extremely worrying precedent in terms of labour rights by compelling individual workers to be effectively co-opted into working for national security projects with no right to refuse or speak out publicly, even if they had moral or legal concerns about the work that they were being asked to do. It opens the door for law enforcement to obtain metadata of journalists without having to abide by the protections that were added to the data retention legislation at the time that that was passed. This bill in its current form would legislate powers that are excessively broad, poorly defined and lack sufficient accountability and transparency. And this committee is on notice of that. At a bare minimum, the bill should be narrowed and minimise the threat it poses to cyber security and the risks that would, that would violate, that would require violations of foreign law. The safeguards should be redrafted to make them meaningful. And this should include the requirement of judicial scrutiny and a right of appeal and a limit of requirements that result in undue secrecy. Passed in its current form, this bill will see us sleepwalk into a digital dystopia. I would welcome questions from the members of the committee, but before I reach that, I believe my colleague Nathan White would also like to make an opening statement. Mr White. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you for the opportunity to address the Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, and thank you for allowing me to speak with you remotely. I regret that I cannot be with you in person as the eyes of the world are on this committee in anticipation, in anticipation of the decisions you will soon make. Access Now is an international civil society organization established in 2009 to defend and extend digital rights of users at risk around the world. At Access Now, digital security is one of our primary focus areas. We operate a 247 digital security helpline that works with individuals and organizations around the world to keep them safe online including to improve digital security practices and provide rapid response emergency assistance. We have done extensive work related to cybersecurity, integrity of communication systems, government hacking, and the importance of encryption. I have previously testified before your colleagues on the Joint Committee on Law Enforcement. Today, I'm not physically with you in Canberra, but I could be. Thanks to the security systems and protocols built into my devices and services, including encryption, I'm able to log in remotely to, to my work computer from anywhere in the world. I can confirm the identity of my coworkers, and I can access any of the information that I need. Traveling to Canberra, I would certainly miss my family, but I also carry a device which contains all of my personal photos, and wherever I am, I can open a window into our kitchen or even my daughter's bedroom to say goodnight. And thanks to encryption, I know that this window is secure against criminals and voyeurs. I feel safe carrying these expensive electronics with me because they have security systems carefully designed by some of the smartest engineers over the years. And that means these devices are mostly useless to thieves, and as such, street-level thrift is down. However, while my devices are mostly useless to a thief, they would be a bonanza of investigatory leads to a properly trained law enforcement officer. With my phone, an officer can get almost anything stored in the cloud, including photos, contacts, notes, and instant messages. With a warrant, you could access my physical location going back years. With judicial approval, you can even read my emails. You can learn what apps I'm using and from there get metadata to find out exactly whom in the world I've been speaking with, when, where, and for how long. And this is if the user practices perfect personal security. Usually people are not perfect and law enforcement is able to exploit those mistakes to get even more data. And in the most extreme cases, law enforcement agencies like the American FBI have been able to purchase exploits to completely unlock devices. Granted, these digital leads can be complicated. Not all members of law enforcement know what data is available, how to access it, how to use it, or how to preserve it for the courts. And getting data from companies overseas can be even more difficult. But digital evidence is not going away. Our lives are increasingly digital, and we're just beginning to grasp the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and virtual realities. The challenges facing law enforcement are complicated, and encryption is only one small piece of the puzzle. There are many thoughtful ways to make sure that law enforcement has the tools it needs to address crime in the 24th century. 
In fact, your colleagues on the Joint Committee on Law Enforcement are engaged such a, in such a, discussion, such a dis discussion. Unfortunately, the legislation before this committee does not reflect these nuanced issues. I encourage you to work slowly and deliberately to consider the full complexities of this debate and to question whether sacrificing the security on which we all rely is worth the short-term benefits this bill might bring. I thank you again for allowing me to participate in this proceeding, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. White and Ms. O'Shea. Any questions? Uh, thanks very much for your detailed written submissions and for appearing before the committee today. Um, one of the remarkable things about this bill, and this is a question for both of you, <coughs> One of the remarkable things about this bill is how consistent a lot of the criticism has been from a range of different stakeholders with vastly different interests. So we have large multinational tech companies, uh, smaller Australian-based technology exporters, civil rights organisations, uh, cyber security organisations, cyber security experts. I think you mentioned cryptographers in your list before, Ms O'Shea. Um, I've got perhaps two questions. Is that usual? And what is it about this bill that has united such a disparate group of organisations and individuals? So I would say about that, that uh, this is a remarkably unprecedented uh, coalition of people who've come out against this bill. Uh, we, as civil rights organisations, are often quite critical of how technology can companies conduct themselves and how they approach the question of privacy. But we see common cause on this issue. And the fact of that, I think, is remarkable and ought to be noted by the committee. I think there is a lot of scope to do proper consultation and consideration of the comments made by this broad coalition of voices. And it's frankly astonishing to me that the process for considering this bill is not being devoted to that task more fulsomely. Um, I think part of the frustration of civil society is that time and time again we see situations where technological projects or policies are put in place and um, decision makers and lawmakers fail to take proper account and uh, listen to the voice of experts in the field and make use of the rich um, expertise that exists within Australia on these kinds of topics. And instead, we see uh, rushed policy, and uh, this bill is a prime example of that, pushed through before the consequences of doing so are fully considered. Um, so I, I do think it is something to note. You do not need to agree with the, um, the statements of a human rights lawyer in, to, in order to uh, accept that there are serious criticisms of this bill. You can, uh, you can listen to significant technology companies that operate globally, uh, cryptographers who have extensive experience in understanding how cryptography works. Uh, you can speak to national security experts. There's a huge number of them who uh, have, have made comment on, on this uh, kind of policy generally, but also uh, more specifically in relation to this legislation. And you can see how common it is that national security experts think that this is uh, a bad precedent. There was a panel of over 100 cybersecurity experts polled by the Washington Post, which showed strong objection to any attempt to provide law enforcement with a backdoor access to encryption protocols. So it's not just civil society organisations that are speaking out against this, but people who have deep knowledge and expertise in this field. Uh, and I think the committee should uh, acknowledge that and take it on board, and at the very least, afford itself the time to properly consider those criticisms and uh, mm. find ways to accommodate that in the process of considering this bill. Thanks, Ms O'Shea. Mr White, did you want to add to that very full answer from Ms O'Shea? Sure. I would just like to suggest that the only people you have not heard from are the people who don't realise how this bill will impact them. We live in an increasingly digital world where all of us rely on the same security tools we all have the same threats of data breaches, our data being stolen, our data being lost, cyber criminals stealing our identity. We all have an interest in seeing stronger security, and uh, there's a real concern that this bill will actually lead to weaker security, which will impact everyone, regardless of where they work or where they live. Do either of you, Ms O'Shea or Mr White, have anything good to say about this bill? The 
committee process has been excellent. I have appreciated the opportunity to participate with this process on multiple occasions and provide uh, I appreciate the efforts that have been made to provide that opportunity, including by having me on the phone today. I, I would say um, uh, I don't. I think it would be fair to say that civil society understands what the intentions of this bill are, uh, but. I think intentions are one thing, what the law actually does and what it enables is quite another. And you should actually create legislation that is fit for purpose, not um, that does not legislation that does not reflect what the intentions are as publicly stated. So uh, I think the the idea that sometimes put that, um, that, that, that civil society doesn't appreciate the, the difficulties faced by law enforcement is an unfair Critique. Uh, I think everybody supports um, secure systems that are that are um, in the technical age fit for uh, purpose in terms of protecting people from hacking and nefarious actors. And I think we can work towards achieving that. But this is not the process to do it. This bill does not do that job. And the way in which uh, concerns uh, have been raised. Uh, without uh, proper time and space to consider them, and in fact, the intervention by um, uh, by the Minister Dutton and Prime Minister Morrison is very alarming. Uh, and I think we ought to take every opportunity we can to think about this properly before we rush this bill through on the basis of of rhetoric around crime and terrorism, uh, because we may be uh, uh, we're, we're going to introduce a number of unintended consequences which uh, are hugely problematic for our digital infrastructure. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks both of you for your evidence. I wanted to um, ask about a specific issue that's raised in the Access Now submission. Um, you talk about some of the problem, uh, you talk about a social problem, not a technical problem, which is that, as I understand it, a lack of, tr a, a, a a diminution of trust in the overall security architecture of the internet could lead to individuals and companies failing to take steps that they're presently willing to take to uh, protect their own devices or systems. And you talk about, for you provide an example which is a failure to patch something. This is an interesting idea that we haven't really explored elsewhere in the committee, but I think what you're saying is that if people are distrusting of some of the uh, commercial actors in the system because they fear they may be collaborating with governments to access encrypted information, they will fail to protect themselves in ways that they're presently willing to do. Is that correct? Yes. And I think it's important to begin with the, the idea that it is really difficult to build secure systems. In fact, we're actually very, very bad at it. We can do simple things and make them secure, but people want complicated things. We want phones that have lots of uh, doodads and have lots of bells and whistles. The more complexity we add to a system, the more difficult it becomes to secure from a technical perspective. It also becomes more difficult because it's more difficult for the user to understand what, it, what is happening. So if you think about where most of the, the cyber threats for stealing data, infecting devices comes from, it doesn't come from the, the zero-day exploits where super smart cyber criminals have built something that no one has ever thought of before. Most devices are able to be hijacked by using something that, uh, by attacking the device that just hasn't been updated yet. You constantly get uh, notices to update your phone, your computer, and a lot of people don't do it. They want to wait. They want to take their time. They don't want to do it. They want to, you know, they're using their computer at the, at the moment. It would be a hassle to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And so there are thousands, millions of devices around the world that are using out of date and in some cases unsupported software. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that are most easily targeted to being hacked. And that's under the ideal circumstances right now where we can say, update immediately, because as soon as an update exists, the system you're using is broken and people can reverse engineer the update to, to uh, attack what you have. Uh, if we cause any reason to not trust the update system, not trust updates as they come out, not, up, not to trust companies to be giving you updates that will help secure your system, we're going to have fewer people updating their systems. 
Uh, and that may be useful for cyber criminals, and it may be useful for law enforcement if they're able to get an individual's phone, but it could have large devastating consequences for uh, larger institutions, say hospitals or servers or anybody who's running any kind of uh, enterprise software. If those systems are not updated, we're going to have um, impacts that are hard to foresee. Thank you. And just to conclude this discussion, why is it that you think that this legislation may make it less likely that people update their systems once updates become available? I think if this legislation were passed, it would uh, cause people to think that the updates they were receiving were not updates meant to secure their devices, but they could be updates in written by law enforcement in order to turn their devices into surveillance devices. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Senator McCall. Thank you, Senator. Senator Mullen. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I, I only have uh, one question, and I wonder if, if uh, you, both of you may like to address it. I just wondered if there is any circumstances that civil society organisations can imagine where access and assistance to encrypted systems such as this bill involves uh, may be justifiable. Uh, um, well, uh, uh, Mr. Sorry. White, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, I was just going to ask if, if you could repeat. I didn't catch quite the quite end of what you said. Uh, thank you. I, I wondered if there is uh, any circumstances that civil society organisations can imagine where access and assistance to encrypted systems, which this bill in, uh, envisages, might be justifiable. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think my, my own way through the objectives of this bill, uh, uh, and uh, I wondered what your views as civil society organisations were. Well, I, I'd have to say I don't, I don't think that I can come up with a, an example where, where this sort of a legislation would be justified. And, and I know we'd like to think of you know, the ticking time bomb scenario where we have to get into the bad guy's device or, or an explosion is going to go off. But I, I think the bill as it is written either would not be able to provide that access or would provide that access in a way that completely undermines our entire digital ecosystem. And I say that because I understand that there are sections that say we can't have a, there, there won't, this won't be used to create anything with a systemic weakness. And there are uh, several issues with that. First of all, systemic weakness is not defined. Further, if it was defined, there will always be disagreements among technologists and policy people over whether or not something is a systemic weakness. The bill currently doesn't have anything in it that would allow the technologists to go to a judge and make their case for why an action was a systemic weakness. Further, even if all of that were to be fixed in the bill and something were to pass, if the Attorney General were to go to a company, let's say Apple, and say this is just one device, we need to get onto this one phone to find out where the bomb is. In order to be able to comply with that, Apple would need to be able to build the infrastructure to be able to deliver something to that individual phone that would be able to do something. Regardless of what that something is, building the infrastructure to deliver that uh, we'll call it exploit or malware to an individual phone is something that can be re replicated across a system. Further, once you know that that uh, avenue exists, you will be putting a target on that company for every nation state, every cyber criminal, and every individual hacker in the world to be able to find that, to be able to exploit it. I guarantee you that will happen because it already exists in the world. There's gray and black markets where exploits for these devices can be sold for literally millions of dollars. If you force a company to build that, people will find it, they will be able to take advantage of it, and they will use that to steal from all of us. So I say that even under the most extreme circumstances, even when we might really want to do everything we can to make sure law enforcement has the immediate access to the data they want, it's simply not possible to do without having systemic effects. If I could just add, I, I think I understand the motivation of the question in that um, in granting broad or extreme powers, is there a way to think about how they could be confined so that they could only be used in very specific circumstances? And from a lawmaker's perspective, I understand how um, one of the ways we might think about this is imposing warrants on the use of uh, a particular power, for example. And I think the problem with this bill is that there is no way to confine uh, the use of the power to an individual circumstance. 
as I said in my testimony, once you create a weakness in the system for one purpose, it can be used for any purpose. Uh, so there's there's no um, there's no appropriate way from a legislative perspective to confine the cryptographic reality of that situation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms O'Shea. Mr White, can you tell us a little bit about the Alliance for a Safe and Secure Internet, which I know uh, has uh, you know, made public comments about this bill and Digital Rights Watch involvement with it? I can. Uh, so in the wake of this extremely truncated uh, period of consultation and consideration of this bill, um, Digital Rights Watch and a number of other civil society organisations have come together with uh, a diverse array of partners in the Alliance for a Safe and Secure Internet, which includes um, companies uh, and industry bodies, which would, which in many circumstances, civil society organisations are not aligned with, and in fact, civil society organisations are critics of. Uh, and I think the fact that we've aligned together to present a united front, that this bill ought not be passed in its current form, is a testament to the serious nature of this bill and the incredible um, potential that is represented by it to undermine the security of the internet. Uh, so the Alliance includes people with expertise in, um, in human rights, someone like me, but it also includes uh, companies that, um, uh, that pro provide everyday services to lots of people around the world and have extensive experience in fact working with law enforcement. We know that companies already work with law enforcement on a daily basis to assist them to do their work, um, you know, in ways that civil society organisations might be critical of. Uh, but that diverse perspective, I think, highlights how problematic this bill is, because despite that fact, despite the fact that we come from quite different sections of society, we're all opposed to the bill in its current form. Sure. So uh, are Google and Facebook members of the Alliance? They're represented by an industry associate, association of which they're members. So uh, a proxy of sorts? I suppose so, yes. Uh, does that sit well with Digital Rights Watch, given Facebook's um, harvesting of data with Cambridge Analytica, Facebook's sale of personal data to Huawei, uh, Google's Project Dragonfly, which of course um, is an attempt to re-enter the Chinese market, market and accommodate uh, the Chinese regime's um, censorship regulations, social is that control. social control, does that sit comfortably with Digital Rights Watch? I mean, if those are implied criticisms of those projects, then um, we share a common view that there's plenty to criticise these companies for. Uh, we also share a view that this bill is deeply dangerous, and I think the committee is on notice of that. The fact that these companies and human rights organisations have a united front against this bill I think tells you something. And it tells you also who are the only people who are in favour of it. I do not think it's lawmakers' job, uh, it's the job of lawmakers when uh, national security, uh, when intelligence agencies and, and law enforcement agencies ask for powers to acquiesce to that request. Their job is to think through carefully what the implication, implications are of giving them those powers and to protect the public and to protect national security as defined by protection of our digital infrastructure. I don't think it's enough to say that this bill is necessary for the protection of national security because what you exclude from the definition of national security is secure digital infrastructure and that's increasingly relevant to, uh, to the idea of national security in Australia. Sure. Well, and just to put on the record, I'd, I'd be on a unity ticket with Digital Rights Watch around concerns with some of the big tech companies and the way uh, they use our personal data, for example. Um, my question is, if we were to jettison this bill, um, who is going to police or regulate the nefarious elements who use encrypted means to, to plan criminal activity and uh, terrorist attacks and the like? Because essentially the, that data is held by these, a lot of these big companies. Um, you know, there's, there's a series of end, end encrypted apps that people communicate on. We know the ones WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram was mentioned in the previous um, hearing with Senators. I'm just interested, in the absence of democratic governments uh, exercising their duty to protect the sovereignty and the security of the people they represent, um, who's going to do it if they don't? And I'm not confident that the big tech companies who have access to a lot of this information will do it because my view is, um, as we're increasingly seeing, profit is driving their behaviour. 
So the first thing I would say about that, I suppose, is that uh, I do agree that you have a duty to protect the safety and security of the Australian population. Weakening encryption is the opposite of that duty. It, in fact, opens us up to risks of hacking by state-sponsored hackers, by all sorts of nefarious criminals. So I think it would be a mistake to assume that passing this bill is a uniform advance of the protection of the Australian public. Uh, we've made it quite clear on the record on a number of occasions previous evidence that this committee uh, uh, has received will also confirm this, that in fact this is a bill that generates risks for our national security because it undermines the strength of our digital infrastructure. Um, law enforcement has considerable powers at its disposal to do its job. They're always limited in some capacity by various rules that we put in place, uh, and that's processes of, of, of court, um, as well as other legislative prohibitions on things they can and can't do. They have to operate in a difficult environment and they know how best to do their job. But I think it's fair to ask why we should put the entire digital security of Australia at risk for the passage of this, uh, this bill especially in the circumstances where we haven't thought through the implications of it in its entirety. This is a 176 page bill. It's been in public for just a short number of months. And now we have the Prime Minister and Minister Peter Dutton pushing hard to get this passed by the end of the year. We need to take the time to slow down, think about it properly, consider all the unintended consequences so that we don't sleepwalk into a situation where we've put Australia's security at risk. Okay, and um, I think I think one of the things I'm, I'm, you could say the tech companies have been very successful in in, in advocating publicly that this is an encryption bill, when in fact um, a closer reading of it suggests that it's it's absolutely not that. Um, it's the assistance and access bill, and again I just come back to three one seven Z G of the bill, which specifically preclu precludes system wide decrypts, and I can refer again to. To subsection 1 a and b um, and on your reading of it does does that not prohibit system-wide decryption once again i think the committee's had considerable evidence put before it in the numerous submissions made by um, a diverse range of organizations and individuals as well as the previous um, testimony just prior to mine um, by senators but that uh, safeguard, I do not think, is worth the paper that it's written on. Systemic weakness is not defined. Part of the problem with systemic weakness is that it can only really be defined in retrospect. So you can have all the intentions in the world that are honourable and good and, uh, and designed for a certain purpose, and post-fact realise that, in fact, what you've done is introduce systemic weakness. Uh, so it's just not possible, I think, to put a protection in there that is meaningful and certainly in its current form, it is not. And, and I, I note also the, the prior testimony to mine from Senators is that there are plenty of organisations who are willing to workshop this. So it's stunning to me that the government wouldn't take the opportunity to do that and would in fact try and rush this through quickly. Um, I, I would also note that uh, the, the other safeguard that contains in the, that is contained in the bill refers to um, uh, the prohibition on preventing a company from patching a, a weakness when it's identified. And I think there is interesting examples of why that, again, is not meaningful. Um, the WannaCry worm that uh, caused havoc in the United Kingdom, including um, shutting down parts of the NHS and diverting ambulances, was the result of a weakness that was identified in Microsoft, Microsoft systems by the NSA. Once again, one of the, mo the most sophisticated national security agency in the world, arguably. And they lost control of that weakness um, and only at that moment did they tell Microsoft that the weakness existed. Um, and so Microsoft didn't know about the weakness in order to patch it. Uh, they subsequently tried to, but by then it's too late. And in fact, um, criminals are able to wreak havoc in our civ civilian infrastructure that relies on digital technology. So what I would say about that is, it's all well and good to say that the government will not prevent a company from patching uh, a weakness when they find it. But if they refuse to disclose that weakness to the company, that that uh, protection, that safeguard in the in the bill, is rendered meaningless. Uh, so I think the the two uh, safeguards that are currently in the bill are drafted so poorly that we cannot expect that they'll be in any way meaningful in the situation where we need them. So oversight from the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security on uh, the TANs and the TCNs wouldn't be enough to uh, satisfy your concerns. No, it would not. Um, I'm not sure what the problem is, for example, with introducing, introducing judicial scrutiny of these powers. If uh, the case is so compelling that they're needed, 
I do wonder why this wasn't considered and included in the in the bill. Uh, it seems like a startling omission, especially given uh, that in relative terms to our um, other jurisdictions that are comparable, such things exist. So no, I do not think there is sufficient safeguards and scrutiny available uh, in the bill to give confidence to the public that this will be used without um, problem and without uh, problems that we've seen, for example, in relation to the Meditata regime, such as scope creep um, and, and misuse of these bills, let alone uh, the security of um, information that might be uh, created and developed, tools that might be created using these powers, how they will be stored. So I do not think there are sufficient safeguards or protections for the public in this bill, no. One, one last question, Ms O'Shea. Uh, do you have a view on Senatus's request in the previous hearing for an exemption from this bill? Do I have any? Uh, I mean, it's not for me to advocate for Senatus's interests, I don't think. Uh, I don't think an exemption would solve the problem for the rest of us. Uh, I think that it's, um, it's the, the, the broad powers within the bill are undeniable and the scope that they create to do things to undermine the security of our digital infrastructure is not able to be circumvented with exceptions like this. I don't think it's sufficient to exclude one company from the application of a broad uh, broad legislative set of legislative powers like this and say that we should be satisfied. We're putting um, the general public security and privacy at risk for the interests of law enforcement and intelligence agencies. I think tr that that's the fundamental uh, uh, premise of the bill. And to tinker around the edges by excluding companies from it would be an insufficient response to the criticism that's been received by the committee and the government generally to this bill. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions from the committee? No, thank you, Chair. Right. Thanks very much, Ms O'Shea, Mr White, for appearing <clears throat> before the committee. You get a copy of the transcript and uh, an opportunity to make corrections to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.